Good afternoon and welcome to another RSI digital panel. My name is Dave Downs. I'm a client advisor here at RSI. Uh, joining me from RSI, we have Michelle O'Neill, who is also in the client advisory department. Michelle, you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. We are extremely honored today to have a couple chef owners uh, on our digital panel. We're going to talk about menu development, menu costing, menu, um, menu tweaking, and just looking at uh, the all things food on today's digital panel. I want to first introduce the digital panelists um, in, in, we'll go ladies first, Zoe Shore from uh, Split Rail in Chicago. Zoe, good afternoon. Thanks for your time today. Hi. Thanks for having me. And then we also have Fred Neuville from the Fat Hen Restaurant in uh, just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Fred, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. I don't want to describe their concepts too much because I want you to hear that directly from the from the <laughs> panelists. A couple quick notes before we jump into today's digital panel. Uh, we will have a question and answer uh, capabilities for you. So if you have a question that you want to ask either of our panelists, please feel free to chime in and we'll get those going. We're also recording and broadcasting this live on Facebook. Um, and so if you aren't able to attend live, we will be sending out the link as well and we'll have it up on our marketing site. Uh, without any further ado, Michelle, let's get started. Let's do it. Zoe, my girl Zoe, I'm so excited to have you, and I'm so excited for this topic generally. Um, we, it's been a long time coming that we just talk about food. So we'll kick it off with you. Tell us about Split Rail's original menu and how that's evolved to what you've got going on. You've been in business two years? Just about two years. It'll now. be two years in June, yeah. Um, so our original menu was just a little bit more focused on the destination diner. Uh, it was a little bit uh, more elevated, a little bit more expensive, um, and just a little bit more perception of it being more high end. Um, in the end, we did decide to, to streamline that and change over to a little bit of a more accessible menu. And so we took our original concept of reimagined classic American dishes and just turned it a little bit to be sort of more straightforward interpretations of classic American dishes. Got it. So within your menu, I know that you rethought a lot of things last fall. What led you to, I don't want to say reconcepting, but certainly going back to, to basics with your menu? Um, yeah, we were, we were careful not to use the word reconcepting because I think that that's a, a little bit of a dangerous word. We didn't change the name. We didn't change the decor. Um, Again, I mean, a number of things led me down this path. I think, you know, one thing that I'm sure everyone in restaurants is familiar with is, is sort of the labor shortage combined with uh, the higher pay that's happening. And while I support the idea of uh, paying people what they're worth, you know, cooks have become twice as expensive as they were when I started this journey to open this restaurant and finding cooks who could execute the dishes we were looking to execute um, without me having to work just around the clock in order to make it happen was incredibly challenging. So we just took a step back and, and took food that I do love to make that I have a great passion for and made that the focal point and everything else took a little bit more of a back seat. And then that way I was able to take my 80 or 90 hour work week down to 70 hour work week and, uh, you know, also work with a, a little bit of a, a greener staff who are really great people, but don't have the experience that I needed for the old menu. If that makes sense. We're going to dive a little bit more into that, Zoe, too, as we're kind of peeling back the onion layers here, so to speak. Fred, I want to go to you. Um, I, uh, about a year and a half ago, had the pleasure of eating at the Fat Hen, and it was one of the, I still talk about it all the time. To anybody that I know that's going to Charleston, it is a really fun, little eclectic restaurant kind of out in the, in the middle you. of nowhere, and I loved it. Um, you describe the cuisine type there as, uh, as low country French. What does that mean? How do you, how did you, arrive at that what what was the inspiration for for that type of cuisine in at the fat end so i was uh classically I, I went to culinary school went to cia gravitated towards uh french cooking and moved here to charleston in 90 97 we are and and in 2007 uh or 2006 i developed the concept based on uh you know we're in the we're in the middle of the farm belt here in south carolina so i wanted to bring a, a flavor i wanted to bring the two flavors together and that's what i did i brought low country uh so we have shrimp and grits along with uh you know french techniques of 
uh, brazing short ribs and things of this nature. And it turned out to match perfectly. I was lucky. <laughs> it's a it's a hit, um, and and it is a, a a really fun place. I haven't had the pleasure yet of eating at Zoe's restaurant, but I'll be there. I'll be in Chicago next week, so I'm I'm gonna pop in and and definitely have a some fried chicken. So. <laughs> well, I kind of want to follow up on that with Zoe because Chicago is such an amazing restaurant town, <laughs> and yeah, I'm sure in terms of local sourcing, there's all kinds of different cultures and 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 certainly vendors that you could pull inspiration from, but how does your neighborhood, West Town, right? How does your mm -hmm. neighborhood influence your menu? The neighborhood definitely influences menu a lot in the sense of, you know, I mentioned before the labor shortage, but it's a big element of making the, the transition with our menu was the fact that we were perceived by our neighborhood, which I live in, which I'm a part of, um, as being expensive. And I think actually being more expensive than we actually were. Like, I think people always thought we were very expensive and, and we really weren't. We had about a $40, $41 check average uh, under the previous menu. And now we have about a $30 check average. So it is cheaper, but it's not outrageously cheaper. It's more the perception. And so that was really important to me was I was just realizing that our neighbors just perceived this as being expensive and nothing we said or did could change that notion. Um, and particularly, you know, there was the ability to go in and spend a lot less if you wanted to, and, and that just wasn't being perceived. And so this new menu, I think, is a little bit more accessible. We do specials and we have uh, occasional dinners that are a little bit different. So we get the opportunity to be creative. And then our, our core menu is accessible, approachable, it's familiar flavors and, and things that uh, people are comfortable with and, um, and it's priced a little bit more accessibly as well. Creativity definitely goes into into the menu uh, design. Fred, how do you manage the creative the creative process? How does that work for you as you're sitting down writing out menus for new dishes or come up with ideas? Is it a collaborative effort? Do you lock yourself in a dark room and uh, in with a with a cookbook and a flashlight? How do you do that? So our creative process is, is what I do is I I go to our uh, sales and look at the items that sell the most and look at the items that sell the least. And I decided, you know, I, I want to change the items that sell the least. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also according to the season. So I'll go to my chef de cuisine and I'll say, uh, you know, what do you want to roll with? Uh, give me some ideas. And then I will break out my books and decide on which direction I want to go in. Do I want to go low country? Do I want to go French? Do I want to do low country French? You know, I mean, so it, a, a wide, uh, a wide array. And that's, that's the creative process to start. And generally how I finish is uh, take, take his ideas and everybody else's ideas and meld them with mine to create something else. How often does it work and how often doesn't it work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I could figure that out. Well, you know, sometimes it takes, Sometimes it takes uh, quite, a, quite a while to develop a recipe. Like I have uh, the rib on the menu now, and that's a, um, a, a cold smoked whole bone in short rib that we steam in an apple cider vinegar broth for four hours. And then we put it on the grill and put our house made pomegranate barbecue sauce on it and serve it with pone frites. That took three months to develop. So, you know, and it's a winner. During the summer, it's a winner. Uh, in the spring, during the winter, it's a loser. I don't know why. I can't tell you why. Probably because of price. You know, it's not cheap. Um, and what percentage makes it? What percentage doesn't? You know, I've had some. I've had some losers that I thought were pretty daggone good. Uh, but I'd say the winners outweigh the losers. That's good. I have a follow up on that. And I, you know, it's delicate talking about the losers, but it happens right? How much of your, in the creative process, does execution and the impact on your staff come into play when you're making decisions on your menu? That's huge. Uh, you know, as Zoe said, you know, labor's tight and you have to find the people that can execute it. And a lot of times you have to spend, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> excuse me, it seems like we keep hiring the same guy and then we let that guy go and that same guy comes in in a different, different form, <laughs> right? I mean, it just is amazing. And so, uh, 
what 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 we have what we, what we've done is we just get down to hard tax and I'm more of a instructor than and an exec you know an executive chef but more of an instructor than anything else so that my chef de cuisine can uh, uh, do his job and so there's a lot of teaching going on uh, you know labor's tight you have to match the menu to what the people can do you can't force it on them so the people matter uh, you know 100 percent so I want to kick that question to you, but change it just a little bit. Um, it, the execution definitely plays into that. Uh, we, our last digital panel that we did, we were talking a lot about budgeting. And when you're writing a recipe or putting together a dish for your menu, something new, maybe a special for, uh, for the week, do you start with a price point in mind or do you arrive at the price point by putting the dish together? How, do, how does that work or is it different sometimes? I generally arrive at a price point. I mean, what, do, there's definitely like a sweet spot of well, we know we can sell pretty easily for the most part. Um, you know, we don't really do specials that are more than like 14 or $15. And even that's pretty high for us. So our usual special price range is like in the seven to $12 range. Um, but that being said, I actually will usually, especially with specials, what I'll do is I'll sit down at pre shift the first time we run it and I'll ask the front of house team what they think it should cost. And then I've got a number in my head of what I'm comfortable with. But if they're telling me something way off, and sometimes it's in either direction, sometimes I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll be able to sell this for $10. And they're like, 12, 13, that's so cheap. I can't believe you want to do it for 10 or whatever. And then I'm like, great, you know, we'll do it for a little bit higher. Um, and oftentimes our special is made with, you know, off cuts, trim, something sure. left over. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to meet our same criteria for a cost of goods that a normal menu item would. It, it's nice if it does, but selling something that you wouldn't otherwise sell is the most important thing. Um, so I'll ask for feedback about what the servers are comfortable, what they'd be comfortable buying it at, because that's what they're going to be comfortable selling at for you, um, is my thought process. Do you ever use that the creation of specials as a way to motivate somebody who may not all be strictly monetarily driven, um, someone on your on your staff that maybe really likes the creative process more than anything? Um, is that something that you've done in the past? I mean, it's definitely something I'm working towards, uh, especially mm -hmm. with my sous chef, and it's something that I would like to do. I, currently, our team is pretty tight. We have, I, you know, I've got three cooks and a sous chef, essentially, um, and my cooks are really great, but none of them are quite there on wanting to do anything too creative yet, um, but it's always an option. I'm always open to it, and at my last restaurant, I definitely did that a lot more, and in our past menu, I did that a lot more as well feedback loop on that one too how do you delicately try and change something that maybe they're really proud of and in and maybe just augment a little bit or if it's uh if it's something you perceive as maybe won't work how do you approach that with those with those types of people sorry was that to me or to fred to fred I that, that was to you though yeah sorry when, you broke up part way through it i apologize oh, I it, just on my uh, end i apologize that's all right. So if someone present, let's say someone did create a special for you and, and mm -hmm. you need to give them some feedback or maybe make some changes, how, how sure. do you handle that kind of delicate feedback loop? I think that's incredibly difficult. And I think um, it, it's a person to person thing for sure. Um, I think that you kind of have to begin with the end in mind. And if you have this sort of dual end of wanting to help drive your team member to have the best experience, best learning experience, and the best ultimate dish, and also to make sure that you're doing a dish that you're comfortable with on your menu, then you have to be honest. But I think there are, there are kind pathways to honesty in that, in that circumstance, which looks like specific feedback and ways you can take the specific thing that they created and change it in certain ways. So you're not just saying, well, that's terrible. <laughs> so no. we, have a, we have a question <laughs> from the audience. Um, and it's it's directed at you, but Fred, I want you to chime in on this one too because I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Uh, the question is, if you have employees creating for you, are you still overseeing the final product to make sure it meets your standard? Uh, yes, absolutely. So most nights I'm the one who's standing at the past expediting. My sous chef does it sometimes. Um, but absolutely, there would be no dish that ever goes out without being tasted, looked at, you know, checked for, for quality each and every time. And, and Fred, I want, I want to ask you, because I know you've worked, both of you could drop a lot of names on here, but I know you've worked with some of the greats. Um, and you've seen different, I think, generationally kitchens change from being very militaristic and old school and kind of Gordon Ramsay 
um, into maybe needing a little softer approach, especially as you consider back of the house retention. So what does it look like to give feedback and, and let your team know, you know, inspire their creativity, but make sure it's up to your standard? Yeah, it has changed quite a bit in uh, the 35 years that I've been in this business, uh, 35 plus. <laughs> uh, today, uh, it's diplomacy. Uh, you know, you have to be diplomatic about what you say. You, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because they've poured their heart and soul into this dish or soup or whatever it may be. So you, you have to uh, be delicate but yet honest uh, and, and suggest changes or uh, you know, it has to be a consistent, excellent product. That's why, you know, you have to check it out. You have to taste it. You have to look at it. Uh, but you you can uh, approach it in a diplomatic way instead of saying, this is horrible. Get it out of my face. Well, and and also, you know, in, in your role, I'm sure you've received your fair share of feedback because, of course, you have guests. You have customers constantly trying your food, and I'm sure you get a lot of feedback based on that. How do you receive guest feedback, especially if you change something on your menu? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I made this, this is just a, a, a for instance, I made a, a, a meatloaf Monte Cristo sandwich that I, I gave to four airmen, four Air Force guys, and they absolutely loved it. It was try, just trying it out. They absolutely loved it. Oh, you got to put this on the menu. You got to put this on the menu. I said, well, I loved it too. I mean, it was awesome. And so uh, a, a woman that comes in all the time got it and said, this is horrific. So somebody's best meal can be somebody's absolute worst meal. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, if she thinks it's horrific, who else hasn't told me that they don't like it? So I took it off the menu. Um, you know, I take, uh, I take, I, I, I listen. If somebody says something once, I'm like, okay. If somebody says something twice, I say, huh. Somebody says something three times, then I got to change something. Zoe, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit here, and, and well, actually, not really. We're going to still kind of talk about the the feedback loop and, and understanding uh, how the front of the house plays a role in that too. Uh, both of you guys are are kitchen leaders, and and that's where you're uh, maybe most comfortable. Um, how do you bridge the gap as a business owner to now be comfortable talking to a guest and and going and and asking and soliciting feedback? I mean, so I actually, um, at my last restaurant, I operated as the chef and general manager for over a year doing both roles. And so I gained some experience there in that way. And so now, you know, as a chef and, and owner of the restaurant, um, you know, I do have somebody, a general manager who's a business partner, but I'm on the floor a lot. I talk to guests a lot and I, I interact with front of house a lot. I cover for my general manager on her day off. So I'm on the floor on those days. Um, as well. And so I, I have a lot of that guest interaction. Was this something you had to learn uh, that, that comfort level of talking to guests? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> definitely. I mean, you know, I haven't been cooking for as long as Fred has, but I definitely came up in a different kind of kitchen than exists now. Um, I came up in the kind of gnarly kitchens where the chefs weren't the kind of people you necessarily wanted guest facing or, or sometimes they would be, but they said some stuff about the guests when, when they weren't, you know, in earshot. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the kind of brutal, abusive kitchen, that Gordon Ramsay style thing that you're talking about. That's what I came up under. So um, for sure, I had to learn how to talk to guests, how to talk to a table and not feel completely awkward doing it. Um, I also had to learn how to respect the guests and appreciate the guests. Um, I had to learn the value of the guest when, you know, when you're working in a certain kind of restaurant with a certain kind of revenue stream and a certain kind of, you know, fine dining establishment in Los Angeles is very different from the kind of neighborhood restaurant I run in Chicago. We're just very, very grateful for each and every guest that walks in the door and we want that feedback. And it doesn't mean, you know, you can't be everything for everyone. You just can't be. And, and to Fred's point, you know, 99% of people might love something and that 1% you can't change your whole menu for that one person, um, but you can show them your appreciation and respect and, and appreciate their feedback just the same. 
Um, and it's, it's valuable feedback. And the more you can get that feedback while they're still in the restaurant, as opposed to them putting it on Yelp and never coming back again, you know, the, the much more valuable. And so we try to make as many conduits as possible for the guests to give that feedback and to make their complaint and for us to hopefully make it right while they're still here. I love that. Thanks, Zoe. I think um, go ahead, Fred. Zoe had a, a great point. Make it right while they're still there. You know, instead of somebody, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, that we are very thankful for all these folks coming in. And you're in a neighborhood and I'm in a neighborhood, Zoe, uh, as well. And we depend on our local traffic. And it always amazes me that somebody will go online first instead of trying to make it, you know, bring it to the attention of a manager so that we can make it right. Because we're, we're in the business. Uh, we deal with the two most imperfect things in the world, food and people. And sometimes it happens, right? Well, allow us to correct it. Allow us to make it right while you're there. Don't get angry and leave and blast it all over the internet. Fred, I take it you're a no fan of the Yelp reviews, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, no, 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 Everybody's no, a I'm, critic. Everybody's I've a always, critic nowadays, I've right? always said running restaurants is perfect as long as you don't have to deal with employees and customers. It's a, it's a perfect <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that, unsurprisingly, we have some more audience questions. Fred, you got a couple of giggles and some ha-has out of firing the same guy over and over again. I have a follow-up question on that. Um, and that sure. question is, what have you done to help keep the rock stars in your kitchen? Uh, so, free parking, right? It's always plus. Especially in this town. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, I buy uh, I buy a keg of they love cold coffee, so I buy a keg a month of cold coffee. Uh, I supply you know two beers a night uh, for those that want it. Um, you know, higher pay, uh, give them higher pay, and just uh, thank them for being there. I mean, uh, the you know the, the the rock stars have been with me. One guy that's been with me for six years. I have another one that's been uh, AM prep chef has been with me for 16. Um, you know, it, it, it's very important to communicate, be honest, and take care of them. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's all you can do. It's pretty fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about the size of each of your menus. Um, and not that size is the only thing that matters, but Fred, how many, about how many menu items do you have on your menu? Uh, and it's approximate. That's okay if you don't know the exact number. Forty. Forty. And Zoe, how about you? It's definitely much smaller. It depends how you look at it for menu items, just because there's like a whole fried chicken section that's like different pieces of the chicken, and then sure. free fried chicken, or whatever. But if you count fried chicken as one thing, uh, we have like usually about five in the snack section, about five sides, and then four or five like salads and not chicken options, generally speaking. So. 15 to 20 all day, probably. Okay. The I wanted to, and the, yeah, the, reason I asked that, the reason I asked that question is I want to kind of drill in, down into, are there certain, I mean, you mentioned the guest check average, Zoe, around 30 bucks. Fred, yours is probably a little bit more, right? Uh, between 36 and 45, but, depending yeah, on. So close. Yeah, so it's certainly in that, in that same kind of range. Um, how much of that plays into the prices that you put on your menu? It, understanding what you're trying to accomplish. Do you, do you take that into account or are you more focused on foot traffic and just getting more bodies in through the door? How does that, how does that play with your menu design and, and your price pointing as you're, as you're developing that menu out? I guess I don't know exactly. I guess I don't totally understand the question, to be honest. <laughs> The, like, I'm to, are you asking? Do I design my menu to drive my price to drive my check average higher? Is that what the question is? I just think that's right. part of it. Yeah, that's kind of part of the question. I'm I'm trying to see if there's specific price points that you're trying to hit on different sections of the menu or in different uh, menu items. Maybe I asked the question really poorly. Um, uh, just to understand what the what what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to hit a certain guest check average, or are you trying to drive more foot traffic? Got through? it. Definitely just trying to drive as much traffic as we can. With this menu change that we made, uh, 30 to 35 feels like very comfortable for dinner time uh, check average. In fact, I expected it to be just a little bit lower. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that that's a pretty good spot for us to be in. Um, you know, a little higher is great, but I'd much rather get 
more bodies in the door at that same check average, of course. Um, and so there is a little bit of, of just general menu psychology that goes into how you price things. And it's the same thought process that had people put $9.95 on menus instead of $10, you know, um, which some people still do, which we've even thought about doing, you know, there is this part of the brain that even though we know we're being tricked, it's like, oh, that's cheaper. Um, and so there are times where you can add another dollar to a cheaper item instead of the dollar to the more expensive item. And it feels like a better value, even though the inverse would be the better value. You know, it's kind of a weird example or way to say it, but, you know, I think you just, I, I get a lot of feedback on how I price my menu. So I'll ask everyone, the servers, my manager, the cooks, like, does this sound right? What would you pay for this? What are you comfortable with? And, and, you know, we have a lot of neighborhood regulars too, who were, when it feels comfortable, it's just like, oh, what do you think of this dish? You feel good about, you know, asking about price can be an awkward moment, but there are times where it just feels totally comfortable and you can do it. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. And, and Fred, relevance on that same question for you, what efforts do you make in terms of your pricing in your menu to make it accessible to everybody and avoid, especially with the French concept, you know, there's a possibility that you will make it a birthday destination or a special event. What do you do in your menu to keep it accessible and increase guest traffic? So we have, uh, we have a hamburger on our menu. You know, we grind it in-house, fresh pomme frites, 13 bucks. You can come in and you can get a meal. You know, you can get a bowl of mussels. We have five different types of mussels. Uh, and that's how I came up with 40. Zoe, you were correct. <laughs> Your old fried chicken. Oh, I got a hustle section. Like <laughs> so five I muscles, five dishes. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So I have more like got 35 it. menu items. That's still uh, a lot. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. No, no, it's okay. So keeping your menu accessible, your pricing accessible. Oh, oh right, right, right. So we, uh, <clears throat> you know, nothing is priced over $36. Uh, I find that that's the that's the uh, the sweet point. Uh, anything above that really doesn't really doesn't sell a whole lot unless it's a special, and the specials sell really well because we're dealing with all the farms around here. Everything everything is you know we use we use all the farm produce and the and the and the beef and and things of that nature and the and the local fish uh, for all of our specials. Uh, they are intertwined somewhat into the core menu, but as you know, getting them from farmers and you know, getting it from the fishmongers, it costs a little bit more. So I found that I can charge a little bit more on my specials, but I have to keep the core menu accessible. So you can come in and get a you know a, a, a small bowl of mussels for thirteen dollars and eat a half a loaf of bread with it, and you're full, okay? Because you're sopping up all the goodness. Uh, burger, thirteen dollars. You know, you can get a couple of. We have small plates, so uh, the reason why we brought those in was to keep it more accessible. So the small plates aren't priced above sixteen dollars, and they're a meal. I mean, I have these guys coming in that are, uh, you know, six four two fifty, ordering a half a meatloaf. I go up to them, I'm like, "Are you kidding me? Look at you. This fills you up." He's like, yeah, this fills me up. Thanks, Fred. Appreciate it. You know, so uh, that's how we keep it accessible. We change out those small plates. Uh, we rotate them in and out quite often. Another participation question from the audience, too. In terms of menu design, um, where you or menu layout maybe is a, is a better way to put that. Um, did you tinker with that? Do you tinker with that? Zoe, we'll go to you first, and then I'll ask you the same question, too. Do you, do you move things around on their pl physical placement on the menu? Um, not to trick guests or anything like that, but to, to be able to try and, and, and drive the, the reader's eyes to a certain spot. Zoe, let's start with you. I used to do that a lot with the old menu. Now it's pretty static. I've got the fried chicken kind of boxed in the center. Um, I think it's important that we keep it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I used to, we used to play around with it because originally uh, our sort of like front and center, like box menu items were like the things that we were kind of known for and those were our highest selling dishes. And so we did try to tweak what was in there and, and how you uh, approach like what to feature. Um, I know there is a lot of psychology around that too, but now we just kind of the Fred chicken's like the main focal point. Perfect, Fred. How about you? Do you shuffle stuff around on that menu layout a lot? You know, if I if I have a dish that um, 
is uh, not selling very well. And I know it's an awesome dish. Uh, I take a look at that and yeah, yeah, I, I will move it around. If I put a dish on the menu, say a pork tenderloin for $21, uh, I put that right up top and it sells like off the shelves. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd rather sell the $36 rib, right? But you know, the $21 uh, pork tenderloin is perfectly fine. But yes, I do move them occasionally. Okay. Got another audience question follow up on this one. What about the front of the house again? How do you train your front of the house staff servers, bartenders to merchandise the higher margin items or maybe even just the menu items that you're proud of? You engage with front of house training at all, Fred? Oh, yes. So we have a we have a, a, a two week training program that they have to um, be on the expediter, they have to work as an essay, they they shadow uh, several servers. We also train them out at the coop, and uh, then they have to pass a test with me, a written test, uh, and it's written and verbal before they can get into a small section. So I'm I'm very uh, very aware of of uh, their their training and what they are able to do because in this day and age, if you're not on top of that and they get on your floor, they could send somebody to the hospital because of an allergy. You know, and the allergies are just so many. It's, it's crazy how, how, how many allergies there are out there. Some of them are, are, are real, some of them are life-threatening, some of them are fake. But, you know, it is what it is. You gotta train your staff to, uh, to uh, accommodate that, accommodate the guests, and know your food, know what you're serving. That brings up another really good point, and Zoe and I have talked about this a little bit before. Uh, polarizing topic, but Zoe, you've really embraced restrictive diet and what you can do, what you can provide, you know, not taking the traditional approach of uh, everybody's gluten intolerant, right? Tell us about your philosophy with, with handling food allergies and restrictive diets. Sure. I mean, we, we really do embrace it. So we are a nut-free restaurant, which I think out of the gate kind of gives us an advantage in the dietary restriction family. So I have a nut allergy myself. Uh, and the reason that I decided to make the restaurant nut free was because I really felt like it was something we could do without sacrificing any quality. Um, and I know the experience of going somewhere being told there is not nuts in the dish and then finding nuts in the dish. And then even having been chastised by servers at various points or managers who were basically like, of course there was nuts in it. And I'm, you know, I basically have said, well, I asked your server, I asked you and you said no. And then I've eaten nuts. I've been chastised for it. I've been, you know, treated badly and so on and so forth. So we made the decision when we opened to be nut free. And I've been really thrilled with that decision because I know how scary allergies can be. And so when somebody walks in and says, well, I can't eat nuts. And we say, well, we don't have them here. Like, sir, like the servers aren't even allowed to bring nuts in as a snack or, you know, somebody can't bring a cake with nuts in it for a dessert. Um, I think that's really huge. And then in terms of the other diet, the other major dietary restrictions, I mean, you know, to Fred's point, there are a lot and you can't, some are harder to, to uh, accommodate than others, but some are very easy to accommodate. So we have a gluten-free fried chicken. We have a dedicated gluten-free fryer. Uh, about half of our menu or more probably is available gluten-free um, or gluten-free by nature. Um, Dairy-free, vegetarian, vegan, pescatarian. These are all things that we have indicated on the menu very clearly, which I think with our concept, our more casual concept, it's a little bit, more organic. I think with our old menu, if we'd had little like these next to vegetarian dishes, it, it feels a little more down market. And so I, it works really well for us now. Um, but we, the dietary restriction, uh, like being becoming known for, for being dietary restriction friendly has been very good to us. And, and we get a ton of people with dietary restrictions in. And my philosophy is, you know, we have 70 seats on the floor in our restaurant. And we're a neighborhood place, so we can seat a tent top on a, a Wednesday without a call ahead. Um, and every tent top has one or two dietary restrictions in it. So if you're not willing to accommodate those restrictions, you lose that tent top. I mean, you know, the theoretical. Um, I have a gluten-free person in my family. I have a vegan person in my family. Uh, my partner's pescatarian. So, you know, we go out to eat. My mother doesn't eat any seafood. So we go out to eat. We've got five different dietary restrictions just right there. And, you know, if somebody doesn't accommodate those well or easily, we're not going to go back. And when I'm trying to think of places that will accommodate them, you know, we're a group that spends a lot on wine, that, that drinks a lot, that eats a lot. You know, we're a group you want coming into your restaurant, but not if you can't do one gluten-free, one vegan, one pescatarian, one no seafood, and one no nuts, you know? And so it's 
it's hugely valuable. Fred, with French cuisine, um, I don't know if you've heard about the, the latest breaking uh, food allergy is butter. So how do you combat that? Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, when, when, you're, when you're designing menus, do you specifically come up with something for, for the fat hen um, in terms of being able to create dishes that are exclusively gluten-free? Your, your dishes are a little bit more um, composed, less a la carte, I guess, than, than some others. Are you, are you keeping some of those in mind or do you create an op alternative uh, to be able to offer some of those dishes, gluten-free, um, any other allergy that may, may present throughout the, the course of the diners? That's a, that's a good question. So we, we, uh, we also have a, a gluten-free fryer that we use for our French fries. And uh, you know, you have to, the servers have to be knowledgeable and say gluten allergy because if they order the crab cakes, well, the crab cakes come off of the station that the the, the uh, fries are fried with the seafood. So there's gluten in that fryer. So they have to, you know, say crab cake gluten free, and then we uh, fry those fries in the middle fryer from from a different station, which are always gluten free. So people are are very happy about that. We are very very sensitive and very aware of. Uh, uh, people with allergies, so we change it. We go to the extent of changing out our utensils if those utensils have gotten, say, butter on them. If 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 somebody orders uh, shrimp and crab hop and john and has a dairy allergy, uh, we finish that with garlic butter and pimento cheese. So we have to make that uh, with new utensils, new tongs, or spoon, whatever it may be, and just don't add the pimento cheese and the garlic butter because that goes in at the end. So you have to, when you design, when, when I design uh, a dish, I have to take all of that into consideration where uh, the dairy product, because I actually have a slight dairy allergy, believe it or not, that, that you know, I got to rinse my mouth out. And, a French chef that can't eat butter? Is that, it's just insane. It's insane. <laughs> I can't believe it. Maybe it's because I've eaten so much butter and cream my whole life that <laughs> I don't know. But anyway. So I, it, it, it's, it's in the forefront of my mind all the time when I'm designing dishes, the steps that we can take to accommodate uh, people that are, are, are allergic to certain things. You know, we once had a, we once had a, uh, a young lady uh, come in regularly. She, regularly, she uh, was allergic to onion, and she would always get the tartare. And so we would always have to uh, pick new herbs because there, there were chives in that herb mixture, which is an onion. Right. Um, well, one time I wasn't there and she ordered a tartare and my chef de cuisine, who was the expediter at that time, didn't think that chives were onions. And so they made the tartare and went out to her and she she swelled up. So, you know, we have to uh, I mean, that, that's that's at the other end of the spectrum. So we just have to uh, in designing a, a, a menu item. Think about that process of how to be of service to the guests with these particular allergies. Does that make sense? Is that that's you bet. kind of long, John? It does. Absolutely. I, I want to shift gears a little bit to to talking about specials and and other things that you do um, and and how those play a role in. Um, in being able to create a following, being able to uh, to continue to broaden your menu a little bit in in some ways, Fred, let's start with you. What what's your approach with specials? Do you do some uh, some orated specials from the servers every night? Do you do specials uh, on different nights of the week? How do you run that program for your restaurant? So whatever's uh, whatever's locally available, like we um, Vital Farms, this guy. He calls me up. He lives on. He li he has a farm on Wamala, which is where I live. Uh, and he started growing ducks and chickens. So I bought some ducks and chickens, and and so that's that was our special. Like today, uh, Mark Mahaffey gives me a call from Abundant Seafood. He's based in Shim Creek in Mount Pleasant. Uh, calls me up, says Fred, I got some beautiful albacore tuna, you know, forty pounders. I'm like I'll take one. Excuse me. So that's what the specials are based on, whatever's local and fresh. You know, we have a local mushroom farmer. Right now, soft shell crabs are in season. Love soft shell crabs. So that's what our specials are based on, whatever is local and we can get. That's what we do. And now they're higher priced because they're local 
and you know they're grown here and you know farmers got to make a living also so and fishermen uh so that's pretty much where where we have it Zoe, what's your approach with specials? You kind of talked about it a little bit earlier too, about maybe using up uh, some things that that are uh, that are off cuts or or whatever that isn't part of the the regular menu. What other kinds of things do you do to to roll out with specials and keep that uh, keep that moving? I mean, so we do. I mean, we do all sorts of things. So we do some themed dinners, uh, different dinners, and we'll have some some product left over or, or you know some things that we need to move through and we'll definitely run those as specials in different ways. Um, we'll also just like feel like playing something. So we'll do it. Uh, we are running a special this week. That's a fried chicken, fried rice. And it's like just been like one of the most popular specials we've ever done. Um, and so I think what we do is, is we run the specials and, and make menu items that really appeal to us. And, and for me, and part of the reason this menu makes a lot of sense for me is that, uh, I really, I think that like dishes from my childhood and nostalgia based dishes are things that I really love and have always loved and was, was part of the core menu before as well. And so, you know, we're always looking for kind of that step up from the junk food you loved when you were a kid. One of the desserts, the dessert we're running right now is basically like based on a ring ding, uh, essentially, but obviously made uh, in a slightly different fashion. And so that's kind of the stuff that we try to run and, and play with and have fun with. And then when those things resonate really well. Sometimes they'll make it onto the menu. And uh, along the same line, Zoe, we have to talk about your theme nights, how you execute them, the strategy that goes into it. Because I know a lot of times with specials, it is about depletion and cross-utilization of product. But when you're planning a theme night, how how heavily does creativity and execution factor? How far in advance do you start planning them? Uh, ideally very far in advance. So yeah, my business partner and I are very into doing themes and it started years ago. Uh, we were participating in Chicago restaurant week for the first time. So for anyone who's not in Chicago, Chicago restaurant week is in the winter, uh, towards the end of January. And it's actually two and a half weeks. On time it backs up right into Valentine's day and it's the busiest time of year. Um, and I had moved to Chicago not that long ago and I'd heard a lot of chefs complaining about restaurant week because you know if you worked in the finer dining section sector you had to bring your prices down a lot and so instead of going to a restaurant and getting what they would normally offer you get a chicken breast or you know a, a pan roasted salmon dish something like that that was inexpensive and you still got the experience of going someplace that felt fancy and for a restaurant like mine and the restaurant that i worked at prior that had a lower check average than what restaurant week was offering you have to give them a reason to come in and so we decided to have a lot of fun with it so the first year uh, that we did a theme, we did uh, Women in the Kitchen, we did dishes inspired by famous female chefs who had sort of paved the way for someone like me to be able to be in a kitchen, um, pioneering chefs, Julia Child and Barbara Lynch and, you know, a couple of other women that, that have really inspired me. And since then, we've done a lot of different themes. And last year, we did a Friends versus Seinfeld theme that really was a hit. And so we didn't want to repeat that for Restaurant Week this year because we didn't want to be boring, but it was such a hit that we decided to do it again outside of restaurant week. So just last week or two weeks ago, maybe we did friends versus Seinfeld again for a week and we, we ran it side by side with our regular menu. Um, and we planned it pretty far in advance, but you know, there's always tweaks and, and twists as you're coming up onto it and it always kind of creeps up on you. You're always like, Oh yeah, I'm ready for this. And all of a sudden it's like tomorrow. And you're like, I'm not quite ready actually. <laughs> so uh, Fred, you also have a unique creative outlet in your cookbook. Talk to us about how the cookbook has been received. Do you find that it might impact your guest traffic or do people just have a hard time replicating what you produce in the fat end? So um, the reason why I, the reason why I put out a cookbook was because everybody was asking me for recipes and I spent <laughs> a lot of time online answering their questions. <laughs> Save your time. Yeah. Here, just buy my book. <laughs> right. So that's what I say now. I say, well, the recipe's in the book. <laughs> so just buy the book. And you can get it, you know, you can get it online through Amazon or you can come in and, and, and buy it either way. Uh, the, the book is a great tool. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they can't replicate it, replicate the, the, the recipe. Uh, and so I always say, if you can't replicate it, just give me a call because there's obviously something that's not being done correctly. And I can help you out with that. 
Uh, so that's how I handle that. But uh, all the ingredients are in there. You know, it's boom, 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 and all the steps are in there. It's interesting uh, when we when we when I developed the cookbook, I should have done it when we first opened, when I was developing the recipes, because when you develop a recipe, you start with a small amount, which is you know four to six to ten people, and then you, you develop there, and then you got to make it bigger to feed 100 people, 50 people, whatever it may be. And so I had to develop the recipe and then 10 years later I do a cookbook and then I got to go back and reduce that recipe down. So that was uh, that was a, a definitely a labor of love. But yeah, if somebody can't duplicate the recipe, I definitely uh, will walk them through it. Couple a uh, couple follow-up questions for both of you, and and this may get a little bit nerdy, but that's okay. Zoe, what's your absolute favorite cookbook? I think probably the Prune Cookbook, <clears throat> Gabriel okay. Hamilton's Prune. Um, I love it. I think it's beautiful. I like the way it's laid out. I generally look to cookbooks uh, for picture inspiration more than recipes, and I just love that one. Um, I also really love Ethan Stoll's uh, New Italian cuisine something like that even still whatever that one is uh is my other favorite one probably those are my two go-tos just look through a page through for pictures awesome fred how about you outside of your own obviously <laughs> i have uh that's a, that's a tough question i have a you know like a, a library of over a thousand books and i refer to them all the time uh one of one of my favorite books and most used book is a jacques pepin late late technique uh, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I use uh, uh, Chris Lessinger's, uh, I think it's On Fire or something of that nature. It's grilling. I, I use quite a few books, but definitely my number one is Jacques Le Pen. And, and Fred, Tatier, of course. Fred, you knew him, right? I, I did not know him. I met him. I met him you in met Aspen him. at the Aspen Food and Wine Festival. Yeah, he actually signed my book, looked at me and said, oh. You use these quite a bit. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Dog, dog-eared and stuff stuck to the pages, I'm sure. Um, okay, another nerdy kind of question. It's a two-parter. Zoe, what's your favorite thing to cook? What's your favorite thing to eat? I think favorite thing to cook is a really hard question. I mean, I think I, li I just like cooking in general, and I think, um, you know, I generally – am most jazzed about cooking something new that I'm excited about, you know, so I think that varies a lot. Um, although, I mean, I love working the line. I love working the grill station, saute station. I like cooking fish. I like cooking meat. I mean, I like cooking all of that when I'm actually just like line cooking. Um, favorite thing to eat? Nachos, for sure. <laughs> That's easier. And then Fred, we'll jump to you real quick. And then we have a couple more quick questions and we'll be wrapping up here pretty soon. That time flew. I'm, I can't believe we're already 50 minutes into this already. Um, Fred, what's your favorite thing to cook? What's your favorite thing to eat? You know, I, I, that, as Zoe said, that's a very tough question to answer. And when people, when people ask me that question, I just say, I love to cook. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I love all aspects of it. It's, it's a creative, um, it's a creative outlet. And you, you, sometimes you don't know the direction that it's headed in until you get there. Uh, and that's a surprise. Some of my biggest mistakes have been uh, some of my greatest successes. And uh, it, it, it's just an, it's an evolution. Um, cooking is adding this, adding that. That's why I'm not a baker because I don't like to measure, but you have to measure when you do a cookbook. So in any way, uh, what do I like to eat? It depends upon my mood. It really does. You know, like uh, I'm looking forward to, we're doing a duck confit special. I'm looking forward to eating the duck tonight. Um, you know, I eat a lot of salmon, eat a lot of fish. But uh, I just I just love food in general. I can tell you what I don't like. I don't like eggplant. It's a textural thing. That's a random. <laughs> that's a random one too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we put it in the title of this panel, so we should talk a little bit about restaurant and menu specific trends. Um, Zoe, any trends well, right Michelle, now? Any I'm predictions? Sorry. I'm sorry. You just broke up for a second. I didn't hear what you said. No, I was, that's okay. I'll repeat. We were talking about trends. I want to make sure we Got address it. that. What do you see the most relevant trends in menu right now? What do you like? What do you not like? Are trends important to you? I mean, I think I think the word trend is a little bit misleading because it 
you know, I don't know. It's kind of a tricky word. Um, I will tell you what I don't like at restaurants right now. My number one pet peeve is an overextended menu tour, especially when the menu is pretty straightforward. I don't like to go to a steakhouse and have somebody explain the menu to me from top to bottom. I've been eating in restaurants for a very long time and I can read. Um, I don't, I don't understand this concept of reading the menu out loud, describing the dishes that have already been described. I've never understood it. There was a brief period where the, the shared plates and small plates movement was a little unfamiliar to people. And so you really need to explain it, but it's no longer unfamiliar to anyone living in the city of Chicago. And even that just needs a brief explanation. It doesn't require this extended long-winded thing that usually ends with somebody telling you that the kitchen prefers if you put the whole order in at once, which is also another thing that I just can't stand. Um, I like this idea of, of telling people what they have to do before they've even started. Um, in terms of what I do like, I mean, I think that, you know, this ugly food movement has kind of taken a little bit of, uh, taken the, the nation by storm a little bit, uh, headed by uh, David Chang a little bit from what I can tell, but I do like that notion. I like the idea that, you know, there is beauty beyond, you know, excuse me, a plate that's, that's done with tweezers and a paintbrush, um, that there's beauty in the ugliness of some food. I do agree that, you know, beautiful food is important, but I also don't think that uh, sort of conventional sense of what makes something beautiful is the most important thing. Um, I love a monochromatic plate of food. I like, you know, a rustically plate of, plate of food. I don't need my plate of food to look like 11 people put their fingers on it um, in order to make it look the way it looks. And so I really am into this idea of uh, rustic and sometimes inelegant food still being worth the time of diners, that it's not just relegated to late night or, or you know, um, guilty pleasures, but that uh, rustic food is taking more of a, a, you know, front and center for the country. No doubt. Fred, what, what role do trends play in your menu design and specials design? What, what, uh, what role do those trends play on your menu? You know, I find, I find that uh, trends don't play at all in, in my restaurant. Uh, I find that things that were once old become new again, you know, and, 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 uh, I'm not really a, uh, I, I, I my belief is that if you take care of the product, you, first you buy the proper product as fresh as you can possibly get it. You take care of that product. You, you do not, um, overuse that product. It's not necessarily the right word. You, you over process. If, maybe? If, if, over processed, yes, thank you. Over processed. Because if you bought the freshest, most delicious product that you can buy, you, you just do it simply. So if, if you buy it fresh, you take care of it, you don't over process it, you present it in a, in a, in a well, uh, in, a, in a great presentation. So it, it uh, so what do you eat with first? Right? Right. You eat with your nose, you smell it. If it doesn't smell good, not gonna be good. Then you eat with your eyes. If it doesn't look good, then you're gonna you think it doesn't. Oh, I don't want this. And then the lastly, you taste it. So that's that's basically my philosophy around trends. You know, I I know this this gastric stuff was going for a while, and you know, sous vide came back when it was you know born in the 1920s. I guess I don't know, but uh, you know, I, I just believe in good wholesome food. That, Tastes good, looks good, smells good. And what was old will become new again. It, did, it wasn't lost on me that you are wearing bell bottoms today, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised Fred Dave didn't get more defensive on that one. You know, he loves sous vide. He's trying to make sous vide happen in a big way, like in, uh, in my kitchen as well. All righty. Well, let me do a last check-in um, to anybody who is listening from the participants, from the audience, if you have any other questions to wrap up. Um, Fred, you answered very intuitively about the gluten-free separation in your fryers. We did have that question for Zoe as well. Um, so I just want to come back to that, make sure we get all the questions answered. Is your restaurant, your kitchen, is it really compartmentalized to avoid crossing with especially gluten-free allergies? How do you, how's your fryer set up? Oh, yeah, there's just a gluten-free fryer. That's 100% of the time. 
it's just the same one. It's kept gluten free. Okay. Got it. Um, so if there are no more questions at this time, if you do have any follow up questions, and uh, as you heard, Fred is taking phone calls if you can't duplicate his recipes <laughs> from his cookbook. Uh, the hotline and, is open, yeah. Yeah, so feel free to reach out to him directly, but I could not recommend both Split Rail in Chicago or the Fat Hen in the uh, Charleston area. What What's the name of the island, Fred? John's Island. John's Island. Uh, if anybody uh, is in the area or you find yourselves in the area, by all means, stop by. These are world-class chefs, uh, fantastic, fantastic RSI clients, amazing panelists. We can't thank you enough, both of you, for your time. Um, it's been it's been incredibly interesting to learn about your menu concept and development, and your opinion on trends. And I mean, my main takeaway is is how you're really kind of more front of the house focused, and you're listening to that feedback, and you're taking part of that. And and you know, Zoe, I really appreciated what you said about honoring guest needs, not just from restrictive diets, but from saying you don't like the way that restrictions are being put on gas in terms of how and what they order. I think um, those are some really great takeaways. So um, for anybody else listening, if you have a topic that you would like Dave and myself to address, or you're interested in becoming a panelist yourself on one of our future RSI uh, digital panels, feel free to reach out to us. Likewise, we welcome any feedback, comments, or follow-up questions from today's panel. Thank you all so much for joining. Have a great day. Fred, Zoe, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Take care. Cheers, guys. Bye.